Happy New Year. I'm Russ Howell. My wife Kay and I have been members of Free Methodist Church since 1979. It's an honor to share with you the final Wednesday word of 2020. Because for me at least, there's a sense that the last message of the year has a special significance. It comes at a time of the year when we naturally look back, take stock, and look ahead, perhaps with a new sense of resolve and purpose, especially as we anticipate an end to the COVID crisis. But this time of the year can also be very depressing, especially if, when looking back, we feel that we haven't made any progress, with no assurances that we will not go through yet another year caught in an unavoidable web of circumstances that we don't want, but which seem to be beyond our control. Or perhaps we fear that no matter what our resolve now, the end of this next year will find us having repeated the same old mistakes with the same old bad habits, so that the current voices of optimism and hope are nothing but clanging symbols. It's the kind of feeling that was evident among the people in an episode of the MASH TV series, which is about a mobile army hospital during the Korean War. At the start of the show, it's New Year's Eve, 1950. Colonel Potter proposes a toast. Here's to the new year. May she be better than the last one. And may we all be home before she's over. Yeah. 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 The show then takes us through that new year with its emergency surgeries, practical jokes, and human interest stories. At the end, it's New Year's Eve, 1951. Again, Colonel Potter proposes a toast. Here's to the new year. May she be better than the last one. And may we all be home before she's over. Amen. It's the same line as before, but as you noticed, his voice cracks at the end. And even though this is a comedy show, it's a dramatic moment. Colonel Potter realizes that with no visible progress towards the end of the war in sight, his rhetoric is almost sheer folly. What's the end of this year like for you? And what do you think it'll be like next year? Will it be one of optimism and joy? Or pessimism and despair? And is there any biblical model we can hook into that might help us avoid the pessimism and despair prevalent in the MASH New Year's Eve? To find out, let's consider what Paul says in his letters to the church at Thessalonica. Have you ever noticed the surprising external similarities between Santa Barbara and Thessalonica? If you look at a map, you'll see that Thessalonica is a beach community. During biblical times, it had a major road, similar to Route 101, connecting it with some major cities. Its climate is similar to ours as well. Kay and I drove through there some time ago, and it was interesting to observe that even the topography looks the same, with chaparral covering the rolling hills. According to Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul first came to Thessalonica after his visit to Philippi. He organized a group of believers and eventually made his way south to Corinth. While there, he probably received a report from Timothy as to how the church at Thessalonica was doing. It was evidently a very positive report, at least according to Paul's reaction to it in the early verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So the church started off very well indeed. But wouldn't it be great if we could look ahead a year or so and see how the church was still doing? Maybe we can. Second Thessalonians was probably written to the church only a few months after First Thessalonians. No one knows exactly how long a gap there was, but as we read the beginning of that book, we can see the Apostle Paul taking stock, looking back at where the church was, 
and seeing how it had grown. We are always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and the afflictions that you are enduring. Note the increased faith, love, and by implication, hope of the church. What specifically did they do that resulted in Paul's joy and optimism? To find out, let's take a look at some of the instructions Paul gave to the church in his first letter to them. It was probably the following of those instructions that caused the church to grow. For much of 1 Thessalonians, Paul is commending the church and thanking God for their witness. He takes some time to review his ministry with them and to answer questions they must have posed concerning the second coming of Christ. There are only a couple of sections where Paul elaborates at length on the kind of behavior in which the church should engage that would lead to a productive and fruitful walk with the Lord, the kind that results in the three characteristics Paul mentions in both letters, an increased faith, love for one another, and steadfastness of hope. Let's take a look at what he had to say. Perhaps we can make Paul's instructions our New Year's resolutions. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. It may seem odd that at the beginning of a list regarding practical directions to the church, we find admonitions to sexual purity. To understand why Paul would write this, think about the surrounding culture at the time. For the Greeks, sexual sin was at best only lightly condemned, and sexual purity was in some sectors thought to be an unreasonable burden. My guess is that Paul was unaware of any specific instances of sexual looseness within the church at Thessalonica, because he doesn't mention any directly, and he does so with the church at Corinth. Nevertheless, Paul is keenly aware of the danger for the Thessalonians to fall prey to the surrounding cultural influences. Hmm. So maybe the similarities between Santa Barbara and Thessalonica penetrate even beyond the exterior coincidences mentioned earlier. This pagan idea of permissiveness has become more and more a part of American society, and of Southern California in particular, hasn't it? The media have become obsessed not only with a tolerance of deviant and unbiblical lifestyles, but also with a celebration of them. In verses 6 through 8, Paul gives us three reasons to follow this exhortation. Let's focus on the last. It is that unchastity amounts to a rejection of God in whose image we are made. The grammatical construction of verse 8 is very powerful, so I want to reinforce it by sharing a true story. There's a ruggedly beautiful and historic place in the Scottish Highlands called Glencoe. One of the most gruesome events in the history of clan rivalry occurred there in the late 1600s. During a harsh winter, some soldiers of the Campbell clan came to the village of the MacDonald clan at Glencoe in the pretext of seeking refuge. Now the Campbells and MacDonalds were bitter enemies. But clan law dictated that hospitality should always come first. So the McDonald's graciously opened up their homes to the Campbells. Little did they know the real intent of Captain Robert Campbell, leader of the group, to murder every male McDonald under 70 years of age. On February 13, 1692, just as the leader of the McDonald clan was ordering wine to be brought to his guests, he was brutally slain. At the end, the Campbell-led soldiers slew 36 men of the McDonald clan and, in addition, some women and children. When Kay and I lived in Scotland, we noticed that even today, people with the name of Campbell would, in certain contexts, 
apologize for being so named because of that incident at Glencoe. Why does this story strike us in such an appalling way? Because it's bad enough to betray people who have been kind to us. It seems much, much worse to violate them while hospitality is being practiced. But this is what Paul is telling us we are doing if we are sexually unclean. Most of the time, Paul refers to the Holy Spirit as being given to us in a single completed act. In verse 8, however, we find an unusual grammatical shift. The construction in the original Greek language implies a continual giving of his Holy Spirit. Here's a paraphrase of verse 8 that captures the force that Paul intended. Therefore, whoever disregards this teaching disregards not man, but God, and at the very moment he is giving his Holy Spirit to you. A nice collection of potential New Year's resolutions can be extracted from 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5, and if you like, you can read what Paul has to say and incorporate them for yourself. To close out our time, let's look at two of them from chapter 5. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Paul gives no indication that the church at Thessalonica is failing to appreciate those who have responsibilities. And likewise, I think that this is not a problem for our church. Nevertheless, Paul thinks this instruction is important enough to hold before them. You know, having respect does not mean that we must always agree with everything our pastors do. On the contrary, it means that if we think something is wrong, or that they are doing something improper, we should let them know about it. But respect also means that we be completely above board in the process, that we don't create factions or behind-the-scenes schisms just because something is going on with which we might disagree. That would not be holding someone in high regard in love. Finally, let's look at the remaining list in chapter 5, but focus on just one item. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. What does Paul mean when he says, pray without ceasing? Literally, the text reads, unceasingly be praying. The sense here is not that we do the impossible and pray 24-7, as illustrated by a continuous straight line, but that we should have prayer as a habitual mindset, as illustrated by a continual pattern. So the passage means, unceasingly, be in a state where you consistently, from time to time, offer prayers to God. When these moments occur will vary from one person to another. Pastor Denny told me that he prays when he runs. I've tried that, but it doesn't work. Running is hard for me, so when I run, I'm too absorbed in self-pity to pray. But that means I must find other times. Prayer is a key discipline to ensure a fruitful life with God. Altogether, that's quite a list of resolutions that Paul gives us. We should remind ourselves, though, that they are doomed to failure unless we acknowledge and rely on the continual sustaining power of God in our lives. Of course, the first step to tapping into that power is to commit our lives to the person of Jesus Christ, whose birth we celebrated this past week. Here's to the new year. May she be better than the last one. And may we all be home with an increased faith an increased love for one another, and a steadfastness of hope before she's over. 
This has been Wednesday Word with the Free Methodist Church of Santa Barbara. We hope that you will join us for worship this week. Our home church video will be posted at 7 o'clock a.m. on our YouTube channel, and we will be meeting for worship under the tent in our upper parking lot at 9.30 a.m. We hope to see you there.